So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is the first uh, workshop for Volunteer Halton for our 2023 workshop season. And I am delighted to have you join us today for our presentation of 100 Common Questions about ONCA, the Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. Um, so just as a reminder, um, the ONCA was proclaimed in October of 2021. And uh, January of last year, January 2022, um, Volunteer host, Halton hosted a workshop with Benjamin Miller, who is here today, uh, called Transitioning to Anka. This workshop was attended by about 150 people as well. We recorded that, and you can find that on Volunteer Halton's uh, YouTube channel. And in the follow-up email for today, I will include a link to that. But uh, after doing a year of these presentations and probably answering many, many, many hundreds of questions, um, Benjamin has compiled the most common questions that he's been asked. And that's what we're here for today, to hear, the, hear those questions and to hear those answers. So I'm really delighted to introduce Benjamin Miller. He is a staff lawyer on the Nonprofit Law Ontario Project of the Community Legal Education Ontario Group where he focuses on nonprofit and charity law and policy. Over the past five years at Clio, Benjamin has answered hundreds of nonprofit law questions. He's also developed an online interactive bylaw builder for the ONCA. He also works uh, at the Ontario Nonprofit Network, and he has worked for the Canada Revenue Agency in the past. I'm going to turn it over to you, Benjamin. Thanks so much for being here. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be back. I always appreciate Volunteer Halton's championing of this work um, and the enthusiasm uh, that Heather brings to it in particular. Um, so thank you for um, that introduction. Um, so as you heard, so the goal is to get the, the 100 most frequently asked questions, but just so you don't uh, listen to a talking head for uh, the entire hour and a half, the way we're gonna do it is I'm actually going to go through only the top 33. Um, and uh, throughout, basically after each slide, I'm going to pause and see uh, what questions people have. And together, uh, uh, my goal is for us to get to at least a uh, hundred of the questions. So how can you ask questions? Well, you can type it into the chat throughout the presentation, or if you prefer, um, during um, the, the periods in which I, I stop after each slide, um, you can raise your hand uh, and we can, we can ask questions that way. So however um, you prefer. So the most common questions fall into um, five buckets, transitioning to the Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, uh, members meetings, uh, those are most common when it, we get to uh, AGM season, um, which is coming up. So uh, it might be particularly practical uh, during this time. Governance structures, so things having to do with your members, your board, your officers, how they relate to each other. Records and minutes, lots and lots of questions when it comes to how to keep records. And then finally, finances and financial review. Before we get into the details of any of these things, um, just a reminder, ANCA stands for Ontario Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, um, and the this act applies to um, nonprofits that were previously incorporated under Ontario's Corporations Act. So if you are a federal nonprofit under the CNCA, if you are an unincorporated association, if you are a business, uh, if you are a part of a municipality, so you're, you don't have a separate legal existence, for example, this presentation isn't going to be uh, relevant to you. This is relevant to provincially incorporated nonprofit organizations. Okay. So you heard I'm from Clio Community Legal Education Ontario. Uh, we're a legal clinic, part of Ontario's legal aid system. In contrast to other legal aid clinics, we don't provide one-on-one -on -one services. Uh, so we don't give advice, for example, um, or representation. We produce plain language and practical legal information on a wide range of topics. Family law, employment law, immigration law, uh, housing law, uh, you name it. Uh, we've got some uh, useful online clear resources for you uh, and potentially for your clients if you work with individuals who use those resources. So I would encourage you um, beyond just the nonprofit law resources to check out some of our other resources on stepstojustice.ca. Now, you're in Halton, but I'm in downtown Toronto, the territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, um, the Haudenosaunee, um, the Wendat, 
uh, the Chippewa and uh, other Anishinaabeg peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis. Um, and I'm mindful, uh, in particular, uh, of my uh, privileged uh, place as a, as a lawyer uh, in uh, perpetuating uh, systems of colonization that continue um, to this day. Uh, and especially when we come to the governance structures question, I am also mindful of the way nonprofit corporate standards uh, displace um, other ways of doing governance uh, that may be more conducive to reconciliation. And so I invite all of us here today involved in nonprofits to think about how is our governance structure, uh, you know, encouraging or discouraging uh, reconciliation? Who's at the table? Why? And so on. Now, I, I share this particular um, image uh, as part of the, uh, the land acknowledgement for those unfamiliar. This is uh, the, the way maps of um, Toronto's uh, subway system uh, typically look, uh, but it's, they've been um, redrawn uh, in terms of the actual um, history uh, of the specific places in, um, in Toronto, how, they were how they've been used um, for um, many centuries. Um, why? Why do I share this particular image? Because a lot of law and a lot of nonprofit law uh, is about naming things, giving things particular labels. This is a member. This is not a member. This is director. This is an officer. You know, all of these labels can alienate us from the underlying relationships uh, of, of community that we're really trying to build or these labels can help us understand uh, the, the meaning and the histories of the, the different roles in our organization and so on. So uh, my, my hope today um, is that, um, you know, the way we, we name uh, the places we inhabit and also the, the way we, we uh, name the different roles and positions and rules in our organizations uh, help to bring us closer, help to foster better relationships uh, and rather than obscure and confuse and intimidate us. Um, and so I'll, I'll hope to, uh, I hope to demystify uh, some of the more obscure names uh, in the ONCO. Okay, so as I am a lawyer, and for those who have seen me present before, I'm very fond of disclaimers. I have four disclaimers for you. Number one, the following is all general legal information. It's not legal advice tailored to your specific situation. So you may ask a question describing the situation you're facing. I can't give advice, not because I don't want to, but because I don't have the proper background uh, on your particular organization. I haven't read your particular documents that would uh, I would need to do to effectively advise you. All right. So everything I say here today should be taken as general information, not directive advice. Number two. This is a high level overview of the ANCA. It's not comprehensive. If you, if you want a more comprehensive treatment, you're welcome to go to our website. Um, I should also note we're discussing the ANCA. There may be other laws that apply to you that are relevant to your questions, such as employment law or privacy law when we talk about records. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions on some of those other areas of law, uh, but just note that the questions I'm dealing with are spe specifically from the vantage point uh, of the uh, ANCA. Number three, uh, this is about law. It's not about best practices. Um, uh, so under the ONCA, there are lots of options that are available to you. Just because it's legal doesn't mean it's a good idea uh, for your a nonprofit. It's up to each organization to decide what makes sense for, for you in your particular context. Then finally, number four, this is about law. It's not about your funders' expectations. Particularly when we talk about financial review, your funders, your donors, your sponsors may have different expectations, higher expectations about what kind of financial review they want than what ANCA requires. ANCA sets out a minimum. Other stakeholders are welcome uh, to, to have higher standards. So that's a conversation for you to have uh, with your uh, funders. Uh, I'm just highlighting the options and flexibilities available under the Act. Okay, so with that, uh, let's begin our first round of questions. So the ANCA transition process. So the first question uh, I get asked is, does ANCA apply to us, right? So I've already alluded to this on the first slide. Who does ANCA apply to? It applies to provincially incorporated not-for-profit organizations. So organizations that were incorporated under Ontario's Corporations Act, and then most special acts. So if you're under a special act, which might have been an act created just for you, or for example, the Agricultural and Horticultural Organizations Act or the Ontario Historical Societies Act or so on. So some special act 
ONCA may still uh, apply to you. If you're incorporated under a special act, both ONCA and the special act would apply. And then if there's ever a conflict, the special act would win. Okay, who does ONCA not apply to? It doesn't apply to federally incorporated nonprofits. So if you're under the CNCA, the Canada Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, doesn't apply to you. If you're a co-op, doesn't apply to you. Uh, that would be under the Cooperative Corporations Act. If you're a condo, doesn't apply to you. And I don't mean any kind of housing nonprofit. There are many housing nonprofits that are incorporated under Ontario's Corporations Act. If you are a condo, meaning you're incorporated under the Condo Corporations Act, it doesn't apply to you. So that's some of who it applies to. And if it doesn't, you can save yourself the hour and a half and, and uh, not stay on this uh, webinar. Okay, question number two. What rules apply during the three-year transition period? So the timeline. ONCA took effect on October 19th, 2021. And there's this three-year transition period that goes until October 18th, 2024. What are the rules that apply in the meantime? So as a, currently, ONCA applies. However, if your governing documents, which were valid before ONCA took effect, have rules in them that contradict ONCA, those rules continue to be valid until October 18th, 2024. So what does that mean practically? It means your governing documents continue to apply until October 18th, 2024. Um, however, if your governing documents don't deal with an issue, they're silent, you have some kind of question, you say, somebody asks you, what's the quorum for our board meetings? You look in the bylaws, they don't say. Well, now you're looking to the ANCA for an answer, whereas previously you would have looked at the Ontario Corporations Act. So th that's the kind of general rule about what the rules, uh, what rules apply during this three-year period. Question number three, can we do the transition in parts? Yes, there is no requirement to make all the changes you might need to make to your bylaws and to your letters patent all at once. You can change some things in your bylaws, some things in your articles, some, you know, you could do, uh, you could do it in parallel processes, you could do it in chunks. There are many different ways that a nonprofit can, can cut up the work. Um, the one thing that a nonprofit really needs to be mindful of if it chooses to do it in parts is how might certain changes to our governing documents affect other areas of our governing documents. Because the governing documents can reference each other in various ways. Certain rules here can depend on the rules there. So it's something to be aware of, but there's nothing which prevents an organization uh, from, for example, making all the changes to the bylaws in, in, you know, one year and then the next year uh, making the changes to the articles or making some changes to the bylaws now and some changes to the bylaws later, et cetera. Do we need to file our changed bylaws with the government of Ontario? The answer is for nonprofits in general, no. Once you've gone through the approval process uh, for how to change your bylaws, um, you do not need to file them with anyone, generally speaking. Now, if you're a registered charity, you do need to file your changed bylaws with the Canada Revenue Agency. Similarly, if you're in a specially regulated field, let's say you're in childcare or healthcare or something like that, um, you may need to file your bylaws with your, your regulating uh, ministry. They may require that. Not all do, but some do. Question number five, where can I find a lawyer to help with this process? Well, um, uh, the um, Nonprofit Law Ontario website, um, which I will put in the chat, Ah, so someone's asked a question. Thank you for that question. Um, the, on this website, you will find a, a directory of lawyers to help with the process. But don't you need to file changes to your articles? The answer is yes, you do need to file changes to your articles if you've made changes to your articles. Articles and bylaws are not the same thing. Uh, so let's take a step back and explain the difference. So uh, nonprofits, generally speaking, have three types of governing documents. They have articles, previously known as letters patent. So this is one of the examples I was referring to in the land acknowledgement about why naming matters so much. The letters patent and the articles are the same thing. It's just a new name. Uh, a nonprofit doesn't have to file any, any document to, to have the name change over. It's automatic. It's the same document. It's just a new title. Um, so nonprofits have articles. They have bylaws, 
Again, you may call it your constitution, you may call it your governing rules, whatever the name, it's the document that contains the rules of governance for your organization. And then nonprofits have policies, confidentiality policies, codes of conduct, etc. Anka doesn't have a lot to say about policies. What it cares about are the, the articles and the bylaws. To make changes to articles, what are known as articles of amendment, um, in addition to being approved within the organization, and I think I will talk about that on the, on the next slide, um, the, in addition to those internal approvals, uh, nonprofits need to file the changes with the government of Ontario. But articles are different from bylaws. Bylaws do not need to be filed with the government of Ontario. Okay, so thank you, Lisa, for that question. Um, do, do, do. So where can I find a lawyer? So our website contains a directory of lawyers. We neither vet nor recommend any lawyers. We just ensure that some part of their practice includes um, nonprofits. The Law Society of Ontario also has a referral service, uh, which uh, gives you a free 30 minute um, referral. What do we do if we don't have a physical address? So uh, for those nonprofits that have already interacted with the online system, the, the new Ontario Business Registry, uh, you'll have seen that you're, you're required to input uh, an address. Now, previously under Ontario Corporations Act, it was possible to give a PO box. That's no longer no longer possible. So the question is, what do you do if you don't have if you don't have headquarters, if you don't have a physical address? So the first thing I'll note is that we at Clio and ONN recognize this is a problem for smaller organizations. This is a problem for those who don't have access to reliable mail service, and we have raised this with the government repeatedly. Okay, but the law as it is currently doesn't accept PO boxes. So what can you do? So here are just a few examples of, of workarounds that nonprofits have used that I've heard of. So number one, um, the individuals on the board uh, or really any individual can offer their address as the official address. The drawback of this is that that address becomes publicly searchable through the Ontario Business Registry and they may not want their address to be publicly searchable in connection with the nonprofit. Number two, using a, uh, an accountant or a lawyer's office. Um, this is a service that lawyers and accountants provide. Um, so it might uh, be something you can talk to with your bookkeeper, your accountant, uh, or your lawyer if you have one that you deal with. Number three, uh, using a community center uh, mailbox. Some municipalities offer the option um, to, to local nonprofits to use community centers as a place to receive mail. Uh, for their nonprofits, and the community center's address could be listed. Number four, um, there are some shared space services in some municipalities in Ontario. So, for example, in Toronto, we have the Center for Social Innovation. Uh, in Guelph, they have uh, 10C, uh, and, and there are some other kind of <clears throat> kind of community uh, shared community spaces like this. So those are just a few examples of workarounds. They may not be appropriate uh, for you. Each organization has to figure out what makes sense for it. Heather, yes. So there is a, there is a question in the chat box. Just at, um, Christine is asking if you could review again bylaws versus constitution versus letters patent. Mm -hmm. Her organization has all three. <laughs> sure. So. Um, the letters patent is the document that the government sent the nonprofit when it first became incorporated. It includes information such as the purposes of the organization, the name of the organization, the founding directors, uh, and it may include other special clauses that the nonprofit asked for when it first applied. So the government created it and sent it to you. Bylaws or constitution, in contrast, and remember bylaws, constitution, interchangeable terms, it's about what, what, what they contain. These are documents that the nonprofit created itself um, and contains rules of governance. For example, who qualifies as a member, um, how many seats on the board, uh, when do annual general meetings happen, et cetera. Policies tend to be more uh, detailed, more um, operational in nature. Uh, so things like a code of conduct or an HR policy, a harassment policy, that sort of thing. Um, in contrast to bylaws, which require um, uh, member approval um, for any, any changes um, to be uh, effective in the long term. Um, policies do not necessarily need to be approved by the members or even by the board. Every nonprofit can decide for itself uh, what the, the approval procedure is for policies. So those are just some of the differences. 
Okay, and so the final question on this slide is what happens if we haven't been filing annual returns? So the first thing to note is don't worry if this is your position. Um, uh, my estimate uh, based on doing these webinars and doing pre-session surveys is anywhere between uh, 20 to 30 uh, percent of nonprofits have not filed annual returns uh, recently. Um, so it's quite common. Um, in such a situation, um, uh, it's possible that the government has the wrong address on file or the wrong directors, uh, which will make it uh, more difficult to interact with the Ontario Business Registry. Um, so for the first order of business is to ensure the government has the most up-to-date uh, information uh, by filing uh, the most recent um, annual return uh, or by filing what's called a notice of change, um, which informs them of any change to the uh, address um, or directors. Now, does does a nonprofit need to file, you know, for every year it missed? Um, the there's no kind of official stated policy, but what I've heard, um, kind of anecdotally, uh, is that the government's often very pragmatic about this uh, in saying, as long as you have the most up to date information, um, we're we you know it's we're not we don't have the time or resources or inclination to go after nonprofits uh, just because they haven't you know filed some annual returns. What I will mention is that if you really haven't filed annual returns for many years. After two years of not filing, a nonprofit uh, uh, becomes in inactive. So you may, if you go to the Ontario Business Registry, find that your nonprofit has the status inactive. And it is possible uh, for inactive corporations to be dissolved by the government. It's rare, uh, but every once in a while, over the past few decades, the government did have the policy of, of going and clearing out the system of inactive corporations. Um, if that is uh, a position your nonprofit is in, um, what may be required is filing articles of revival, um, which basically you know, revives the, the corporation from the dead as if it had never been dead. Um, and so that's, that's an additional uh, form that may need to be filed. And you may need uh, want to seek legal advice as part of that process, as there could be some complexities. Um, Benjamin, a question that was asked to me was uh, for charities, uh, do who do amended bylaws have to be filed with? So uh, with the Canada Revenue Agency, and there is a form online. So if you Google CRA file changed bylaws, um, you know you will uh, you will see uh, there's a, a form will pop up and that you just need to fill out. Um, so it's a pretty streamlined system. Okay, we've got a few other questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, questions I, around you've got you've got them. Yeah, I can go through. Okay, that. All perfect. Right. So if you establish an office address, e.g. board member, can we still keep our existing mailing address? Um, so so absolutely. So that, this is a good question to highlight. Like, what is the function of an office address for, for the, the corporate system? So it does two things. It tells the government two things. Firstly, it tells the government this is where you're supposed to be keeping records. Um, but the board can pass a resolution and say, we're going to keep records elsewhere. It just if you don't pass that resolution, Lanka says your official address, that's where you're expected to keep records. And then number two, this is where the government is going to send official uh, notices and, and, and forms to. It'll be to that address that you listed as your official address. But for other purposes, for your contracts, where you ask your telephone company to send your bills and all that kind of thing, you could list whatever address you want. So um, you can you can keep a mailing address, you can keep a separate address, whatever you want. Um, the official address, it just serves those two functions I mentioned. Which of the three need to be in compliance with ONCA, which are filed slash approved and by whom? Uh, so the so in terms of which need to be brought in compliance with the ONCA, I mean, in theory, all the governing documents need to be in compliance with ONCA. Um, but in terms of practically speaking, <clears throat> what what most nonprofits might need to or want to change, ONCA most directly affects the articles and the bylaws. ONCA doesn't have a lot to say about policies, um, although depending what's in your policies, uh, they, there, there, there may be some effects on the policies, but mainly it's about articles and bylaws. So if you go to our website and you look at what the resources are, they're mainly about articles and bylaws. Um, so which need to be filed? So the articles need to be filed with the government of Ontario. Um, and with the Canada Revenue Agency, if you are a registered charity. The bylaws um, only need to be filed with the Canada Revenue Agency if you're a registered charity. 
policies, generally speaking, don't need to be filed with anybody. Okay. If you're a specially regulated nonprofit, there may be different rules for you. So, for example, childcare has uh, the Ministry of Education has special rules about the, the, what policies they have on file and so on. Do all nonprofits need to file an annual return? What are the criteria? Yes, all nonprofits need to file an annual return. So there's the, this is um, different from the annual return for the, the Income Tax Act purposes. So for the Income Tax Act, um, only nonprofits that meet certain income and asset thresholds need to file uh, a nonprofit information return. All nonprofits need to file a T2, meaning a corporate tax return, even if it's just to say we're a nonprofit, we don't owe you any taxes, but all nonprofit corporations do need to file a T2, but not all nonprofits need to file uh, a, a, a nonprofit information return for the Canada Revenue Agency. Okay, that's federal. Now, provincially, when it comes to filing an annual corporate return, all nonprofits, regardless of their income, regardless of their purpose, need to file uh, uh, an annual return. Um, with the exception of certain special act corporations like agri uh, agricultural and horticultural organizations have special rules about their returns and so on. Um, so, but the general rule is all nonprofits. Um, uh, if you don't have a special act just for you, all nonprofits um, need to file annual returns. What is an annual return? Great question. Um, an annual return um, is it's a uh, a form to be filed? I actually, have one right here. Uh, a form to be filed, uh, basically informing the government: Did your office change? Did your directors change? Did your officers change? And the answer could be no to all those things. But you have to file a return saying no. None of these things changed. To summarize and make sure we have this straight: Bylaws amended, sent to CRA only if you're a, chair, a registered charity. Don't need to do it for most nonprofits. Articles amended, sent to government of Ontario. Correct, right? And, and the articles would, would also need to be uh, sent to CRA. Um, Ken asks, uh, how long do we need to keep records for ONCA or Canada Revenue Agency? Uh, great question. I will deal with this on a later slide in more detail. Um, Christina, uh, uh, no, it's not interested in policies, just interested in letters, patent, constitution, and bylaws. Right. So the one thing I would know is just constitution and bylaws, those are, those are generally speaking two names for the same thing. The question you're asking is, does this document contain our governing rules? All right. So that completes slide one. And uh, so we're up to 12 questions. So we're, we're making good time. Anka transition process, slide two. Could the ONCA transition process compromise our charitable status? So if you're a registered charity, which means uh, you have the ability to issue tax receipts, right? You're registered with the Canada Revenue Agency. And you may be wondering, uh, could ONCA affect our charitable status? So the answer is generally speaking, no. There's nothing in ONCA uh, which would put you offside of Income Tax Act rules. Um, the the way the ONCA transition process may indirectly affect you is in two ways, as just common examples. Number one, um, CRA expects governing documents to be filed with them, as we just discussed. So if a nonprofit makes, if a charity makes the changes and then doesn't file it with the CRA, technically you violated a CRA policy. Now, is this gonna cause you to lose charitable status? No, probably not. It's not a very serious thing. CRA has bigger fish to fry, but technically speaking, it's an expectation of the CRA that registered charities file these things. Number two, if you are pulling out your letters patent, remember another name for articles, if you're pulling out your articles, blowing off the dust, right? It's the first time you've looked at them in decades. And you look at the purposes listed on the, the articles and you're like, what? These are our purposes? We don't do any of this anymore, right? Or, oh, that's some really outdated language, right? So you go and you change those purposes. That's fine. Anka doesn't require you to change your purposes, but you figure it's a good time while you're changing other things. Let's change our purposes. That's fine. For registered charities, it's vital to ensure that the purposes remain exclusively charitable. 
if a charity you know accidentally changes the purposes and they're not exclusively charitable this could cause a charity to lose its charitable status because its purposes need to be exclusively charitable so particularly if you are considering changing your charitable purposes that would be a place where it would be worthwhile to consult with a, a lawyer who's knowledgeable in charity law all right is the government agency the same uh, as the obr ontario business registry um, great question. So I'll, uh, let's explain a few names here. So the Ontario Business Registry is the new online system. It applies to nonprofits, for-profits, co-ops, a whole bunch of different types of organizations can use the system. Service Ontario is responsible for administering the system. So if you have some kind of IT complaint, who are you calling? You're calling Service Ontario. That's who's putting you on hold for four to five hours. It's not us, right? Um, the now Service Ontario is part of the Ministry of Public and Business Service Delivery, um, formerly known as the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services. They are responsible for the policy and the law um, of ANCA. So if you have a concern, let's say you think it's unfair that ad appeal boxes are no longer accepted and you wanna know which minister am I writing to to complain, it's the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Okay, the, um, uh, so those, those are some of the people involved um, at, the, at the provincial level. There's also the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. The Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee is responsible for overseeing charities. So if you're a charity going through this system and you're making changes to your purposes, under some circumstances, you may need to talk with the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee. So those are some of the key names. Okay, so what are the costs um, associated with the transition? So the short answer is there are no necessary costs actually associated with the transition, meaning it's quite possible that all a nonprofit chooses or needs to do is make changes to its bylaws, which cost nothing, um, and it can continue on its merry way. So here are some of the costs that may come up. If a nonprofit uh, chooses um, to make uh, changes to its articles or, or finds that it needs to make changes to its articles, filing articles of amendment costs um, about 100, 150 something dollars just to file, okay? Um, the, so that, that may be a cost. If a nonprofit doesn't have a copy of its letters patent or its articles and needs to order them, um, unfortunately, now there is a cost to ordering them. Um, through the Ontario Business Registry. And uh, the I, I haven't actually checked the price uh, of this, but the last time I heard from a nonprofit who did this, they told me it, co it, it cost over $300, um, which is uh, unfortunate. Um, for a nonprofit um, that is figuring out whether the government has the right address and, and directors on file, um, so it wants to figure out uh, if they need to update the information um, in order to get access to the Ontario Business Registry. Um, then that, um, I believe the cost of ordering what's called a corporate profile um, is $100. So the, these are some of the costs of just dealing with the system. Now, if a nonprofit chooses to work with a lawyer, quotes very widely and it, it really matters you know how old is the organization how complex is the organization how large is the organization um, but some typical quotes I've heard range from um, 1250 to 2500 to do a review um, of, of governing documents now it is possible uh, and, and that will be the, the quote will vary based on the seniority of the lawyer you're working with and where the firm is located and all kinds of things the specialty and so on um, a nonprofit can always cut down on those costs by doing a lot of the work in-house. So Heather uh, mentioned uh, our, our website has a bylaw builder, right? So uh, rather than get a, a lawyer to draft it all from scratch, um, the bylaw builder allows nonprofits, if they're looking to draft bylaws from scratch, to do it themselves so that the cost is reduced to just reviewing, which is generally speaking less time consuming uh, and less labor intensive uh, than drafting. Um, additionally, by informing yourself, by educating yourself ahead of time, you are better able to ask the right questions to the lawyer. 
um, so you are not, uh, you know, being charged uh, for time that you know you could have uh, figured out, you know, ahead of time, or is it was a result of uh, a, a vague or a general question that could have been a more targeted question. So those are some examples of ways to reduce the costs. Okay, seeing some questions in the chat. Um, if you are a registered charity and make changes to the articles, you need to file them with the Ontario government, government, right? Do you also have to file them with the CRA? Correct, Sean is correct, it's both. Uh, uh, you would think that the two agencies could have access to our file, so we update in one place. Yeah, yeah, you would think. Um, one thing, you know, I'm, I'm often, uh, let's say a bit uh, harsh or unfair to the government, but it is, um, when you see it from the government's perspective, the complexity from an IT perspective and synchronizing many of these systems across many different laws uh, that change for different reasons and at different paces. And you also consider the fact that the CRA has to do this, not just with Ontario, but with all the provinces and territories, you can, you can become a bit more sympathetic to why it is they don't share as much as you think they could. But yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, it, would, it would definitely be more streamlined if all these systems could be synchronized. Um, Diana asks, we are currently not registered and non-incorporated. What are the legal costs to do so? Um, so, so that really varies. I, there are, there are some out of the box incorporation services, uh, that, you know, uh, will, will charge like a few hundred dollars. You could do it yourself. There's no requirement to do it with a lawyer. Um, in which case it's about $150 just for the, the, uh, the incorporation. It also depends if you incorporate federally or provincially, there are different costs. It's a bit more federally, um, but they have a bit much more streamlined system. Um, and it also depends on the complexity of your organization, how, how customized you want the governance structure to be and so on. So those are just some of the variables to um, the costs. And thank you, uh, Gail, uh, for that. Yeah, there's also the name, ordering the, the name report. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and I think this is a, a great example of how you can always learn from each other, right? You don't need to wait uh, for somebody to put on a workshop. That's the beautiful thing about networks uh, like Volunteer Halton. Uh, you all have uh, enormously valuable experience that you can share. Okay, how long does it take to transition? So um, average transition times that, that I've heard range from um, six uh, to 12 months. In terms of what variables could cause it to take a shorter period of time or longer, so there are four in particular um, that have struck me as being particularly important. Um, so number one, the age of your organization. So if, if this is the first time in a long time that you've been looking at your governing documents, it's likely there will be other things beyond ANCA uh, that you need to change, and uh, that could take longer. Right. Versus if you're relatively new, you, you don't have a very complicated corporate history and so on, uh, it can take shorter. Number two, your capacity. Uh, if this is the first time your, your board of directors is even looking at your bylaws in a while, they're, they're gonna need to take some time to just learn what's in the bylaws. Um, if uh, the, you don't have, let's say a very governance oriented board or you have one person who, who likes reading bylaws and other, the others are sort of you know, intimidated or, or don't feel comfortable reading bylaws because it's very legalistic, then just getting comfortable uh, with the bylaws is gonna take some time. From a psychological perspective, uh, we tend to procrastinate those things we're uncomfortable with. Um, so that could also cause it to take um, longer. Uh, so on the other hand, what this alerts us to is that the Anka transition process can actually be a great learning opportunity and a great opportunity um, to get your board or your staff or your volunteers comfortable with the idea of governance and familiar uh, with your governing documents. So it takes longer, but it can be more valuable in the long term, both from a compliance perspective and also just from a general uh, kind of getting the most out of your governance structure perspective. So those are the first two, age and capacity. The third is the level of agreement in your organization. Um, sometimes uh, Anka kicks up the dust of questions that uh, people would best left, you know, not dealt with. Um, and unfortunately, Anka be, may be both that opportunity or that requirement to finally deal with these questions. Things like membership structure uh, and rights can be sticky issues, and there may be different opinions on the board or between the board and the members or amongst the members, uh, and so it can take longer to build consensus. 
One thing I would note is that although it takes longer, taking the time to build consensus, taking the time to get the viewpoints of all those who are actually going to have to live with the rule, uh, better sets you up for compliance in the long term. At the end of the day, Anka compliance is not just updating your documents, it's living with whatever rules you set out in your documents. And if people aren't comfortable with the rules that you set out or they disagree with them, um, uh, it'll be less likely that they will comply with those rules uh, once you've um, made those changes. And then finally, um, uh, number four, how easy is it for you to have members meetings? Ultimately, members approval is required to change both the bylaws uh, and the articles. So if it's difficult for you to get quorum, if you can't really hold meetings besides the annual general meeting, then uh, you may be um, stuck waiting until the next annual general meeting to pass any of the changes that you may have uh, decided on uh, in the interim. So that can cause uh, changes to your timeline. Excuse me. Um, what if we don't have a letters path? Uh, so this is quite common. In fact, just this morning, I got a question uh, from someone who's saying they didn't have a letters patent. In that case, you can order one through the Ontario Business Registry. As I mentioned, there's a fee associated with this. Do we need to change our bylaws again if we recently changed them? So um, ONCA was first passed in 2010, and it didn't take effect until 2021. So there was this 11-year period where people were kind of in limbo. And during that period, many nonprofits did make some changes or consulted with uh, a lawyer to make their bylaws as compliant as possible. Now, there have been further changes made to the ONCA since 2010. There were changes made again in 2017 and changes made again in 2021. Uh, so it could be that some things which were required are now no longer required. Some, thing, uh, some things which were not possible before are now possible. Uh, so it, it, whether or not you need to make changes, I can't speak to your specific situation, um, but there, there may be opportunities uh, for you to make changes. So it's a, you, at, at the very least, you can't assume that you don't need um, to make changes just because you made them in 2020, let's say. Where should we start the ANCA transition process? So there are many uh, ways a nonprofit may start the process. Um, one way is to go to the Ontario Business Registry um, and to search uh, your nonprofit uh, on the registry um, to order a corporate profile and figure out, does the government have the right address and directors on file? Um, this is good information to know because to ultimately gain access to make changes in the Ontario Business Registry, you're going to need uh, what's called a company key. Okay, so the company key, the way you get this key is you order it from the government of Ontario and they send it to you in the mail. If they have the wrong address, they're going to send it to the wrong address and you're not going to get your company key. Uh, so making sure they have the right address um, is uh, important. Uh, so that could be a place to start. Another place to start is by getting uh, your records together um, that you need uh, both to comply with ANCA and for the ANCA transition process. And we'll talk more about what those records are later. Those are two starting points. Um, understanding what's in your current governing documents could be uh, another starting point. With that, I'll look at, uh, we'll stop for questions and uh, I'll see you in the chat. If we have both bylaws and a constitution, can one of our changes to the bylaws be to nullify the constitution or say that the bylaws supersede the previous docs, uh, but not letters patent? Okay, so this some, sometimes happens where uh, a nonprofit has both bylaws and a constitution. Uh, in fact, um, there are even a few court cases about this um, where people tried to argue, you know, the bylaws take precedence over the constitution. And basically what the, what the court in that case said was, um, it looks to us like your bylaws and constitutions have been historically treated exactly the same, meaning you both uh, needed board approval, they both needed member approval, they both contain your governing rules. So because they are treated the same and they contain the same kind of thing, we're going to treat them as essentially equivalent and one does not trump the other. Um, now, it's possible for a, um, uh, a nonprofit to set up rules of interpretation within its governing documents in terms of uh, hierarchies. With, the above being, with that being said, um, uh, the articles trump the bylaws and or constitution, whatever you might call it. So that can't be changed. ANCA trumps both, meaning the, the articles and the bylaws, um, they can only make changes where ANCA says they're allowed to make changes. They cannot trump 
uh, rules in the ANCA where ANCA says, you know, the, the, it doesn't say there's any room for the articles or bylaws to make changes to those rules. Um, so to address the question, so for an organization that has both bylaws and constitution, um, can, can they change the bylaws to nullify the constitution or say that the bylaws supersede previous documents? So in general, uh, when when changes are are made to to bylaws, um, it's possible to say yes. This is the most up to date document. Uh, this supersedes all past documents. These are our governing documents as a way to kind of clarify uh, that any past documents no longer apply. That's one strategy nonprofits use. Are there other questions about the ANCA transition process or anything else we've discussed so far? Uh, oh, there we go. Um, I have uh, on my OBR file confirmation of receipt of our amendment to the articles. I understand that I should receive a certificate of amendment at a cost of about $150. I can get no response from the OBR on how to proceed. Help. Okay, so um, the confirmation of receipt uh, means that they've received what you submitted. Okay, so that's different from uh, them uh, sending a certificate saying we approve uh, what it is you submitted. Um, they may be backed up. The, in general, I'll say the ministries, uh, you know, this is a very uh, demanding time for them because a lot of nonprofits are, are transitioning to the, the new rules. Um, so they're, they're working through lots and lots of files. Um, so, you know, I don't know the specific timeline and I, I'm not up to date on, on what the back end typical timelines are for them. Um, unfortunately, it is difficult to get a hold of them again because they're facing lots of demand uh, these days. Um, the uh, so that's the kind of only context I can provide. Um, if a nonprofit has kind of done all all it can, uh, you know, the the the, advan the advantage of hiring a lawyer in a situation like that is the lawyer may have contacts in the ministry, for example, or they may just be a zealous advocate and follow up a lot. Right, but uh, generally speaking, besides knowing knowing who to talk to or being, um, uh, you know, a nudnik, um, it, it there it, there isn't much a nonprofit can do if it's done uh, all it can. Uh, okay, can you review getting the key again as a starting point, please? Sure. So if you go to the Ontario Business Registry um, website, then uh, and you scroll um, down. Um, you'll see there's a button uh, for order company key. It's called a company key. So you click on that button and it'll ask you, and firstly, anybody can order the company key. So it doesn't have to be the executive director or the chair of the board or whatever. Anyone can order it. What they have to do is they have to provide the official address of the corporation. Um, if, the cor if it enters the wrong address, it may just reject the filing, uh, the, the request. Um, uh, or uh, I believe that's what it's supposed to do, um, or it may send it to the wrong, uh, the wrong address if, you have an out of, if they have an out-of-date address on record. So if you, you order, the, let's say you, you go, you submit the address, your, the current address of your nonprofit, and it rejects it, what do you do? So at that point, you go back to the homepage of the Ontario Business Registry, you scroll up a bit, and you click Search uh, Ontario Business Registry um, for a corporation. You search your official legal name, so not just your colloquial name that everybody uses, right? Let's say your your acronym is OMN, right? You're the the Ontario Masquerade Network. You're the, a network of masquerades. Uh, you put on balls, right? Um, so you put in the official legal name, Ontario Masquerade Network, and you search it. Okay, so a bunch of results are going to come up. You click on your your the correct result. That is going to open up a bit more information about your nonprofit. In the top left corner of that page will be order search products. It'll be in the in the green slab, right? If you're uh, you um, if you're viewing uh, the screen in that way, um, and uh, the color green is accessible to you, it'll appear as a green uh, slab, and the button will be kind of in the left, uh, the top left. You click order search products. It'll give you examples of the things you can order. Um, you can order governing, uh, you can um, uh, uh, order a corporate profile and the corporate profile will tell you, do they have the correct address and directors on file? Um, if the answer is yes, 
then you, you have some kind of IT difficulty. But if the answer is no, then you know what you need to do is file a notice of change. So the way to file a notice of change, because you don't have the company key, you have to go to a third party provider. And there's another fee associated with this. Um, so you back out to the homepage of the Ontario Business Registry, you scroll down, there are two third party providers, Dai and Durham, and, uh, and eCore ESC services. You choose one of them and you can file a notice of change through them. You can update the address and then you can request the company key to that address. You can also ask the uh, third party provider to request the company key, uh, but I believe it's much more expensive and it's not necessary to have them do it. Um, how long do we need to keep records for ONCA or the Canada Revenue Agency? So I will address this in the records section. I know there have been a few questions about records already, um, but I'll just give you the short answer is um, Anka requires you to keep all your minutes from all time. That is not practical for most nonprofits. Um, uh, if it's just if if you simply do not have some of your records, um, you know, the best legal advice in the world isn't going to make them appear out of thin air. Um, so here's where I emphasize that there are no ANCA police. It's nobody's job in the government to knock on your door and ask you, have you complied with ANCA? Do you have all your records? Um, the way ANCA gets enforced is directors, members, officers, in some cases, uh, lenders, um, and in some cases, others have the right to take the nonprofit to court um, and, and you know, demand that they comply in various ways. But a court can't make minutes a period of thin air either. So practically speaking, uh, nonprofits that do not have complete records, uh, you know, um, uh, what, what can they do, right? Um, for, from the Canada Revenue Agency perspective, um, the most important is the, the last seven years, because the Income Tax Act requires that nonprofits, just like other taxpayers, keep seven years worth of records um, in case the CRA wants to um, audit. And if a nonprofit doesn't have records for the last seven years, that in itself uh, uh, can be a violation of the Income Tax Act and can be problematic, particularly if you're a registered charity. So that's really the period um, uh, to, to concentrate in. Outside of the seven-year period, it's much more of a risk assessment. Okay, uh, Jim asks, can our not-for-profit create more than one access point from uh, using the key we received from the OBR example, our accountant and one of our directors? So the key can be given to, to multiple people. They'll be using the same key. The other um, two pieces of ID that a nonprofit needs to access the Ontario Business Registry is, is um, a one key uh, and a Service Ontario account, right? So uh, in order to use the, the corporate profile, uh, whoever you're giving you know, access to is gonna have to have those three things. Now, obviously, so the person who has access to these three, th three things has the power to do things like change who the directors are on the government uh, registry for the nonprofit. So, you know, uh, giving it to more people, make sure, you know, you trust those people. Um, but uh, it is possible to give more than one person access. Is there a contact within Service Ontario Ministry with whom we can contact uh, for the key items of interest to Anka? Service Alberta provided such a contact for nonprofits. You are right that Alberta has, generally speaking, done a pretty good job of having point people for the nonprofit sector. Uh, Ontario has um, um, doesn't have any official roles uh, of uh, people um, who uh, work uh, with nonprofits, and I don't particularly have the contact information uh, of, of of people who may informally have the role of working with nonprofits. Um, okay, uh, to confirm the hierarchy of documents. So ANCA is at the top in terms of rules, yes. Then articles, yes. Then bylaws, yes. Uh, and then policies, yeah, that is correct. All right, some great questions. So next, members meeting. So I'll just address two questions here. So number one, are online meetings allowed under ANCA? So the answer is yes, they are definitely allowed. Um, governing documents can say they're not allowed. If governing documents say nothing about online meetings, then the default under ANCA is that individuals can participate online, 
but they cannot vote online. So if you want an individual to both be able to participate and to vote, that needs to be actively empowered uh, within the governing documents. Now, uh, during COVID-19, special rules were put uh, in place that basically said, regardless of what the governing documents say, online meetings are allowed, online voting is allowed, etc. Those rules are still in place until September uh, 30th, 2023. So, um, uh, at, and I suspect, uh, based on um, public consultation that the government did about a year and a half ago about um, things like online meetings in the Yonka and so on, I suspect that new rules will be brought in to allow online meeting and voting by default under Anka after September 30th, 2023, but I have no way to guarantee this. It's just something for nonprofits to keep an eye on, and you can subscribe to, to updates if you want on our website, um, but for the time being, Online meetings are allowed even if your bylaws don't allow them. Number two, when do AGMs need to happen? AGM uh, is short for annual general meeting. Annual general meeting is another name for members meetings um, that need to happen on an annual basis. When do they need to happen? So AGMs need to happen within 15 months of the last annual general meeting. Okay, so a 15 month period and within six months of the end of fiscal year. Okay, so whichever is the earlier of those two dates, that's the deadline for the annual general meeting. I see there are some comments in the chat. Uh, yes, three things to access the OBR. Number one, the company key. Number two, the one key. Number three, Service Ontario account. Uh, uh, Tamara asks, how will we know about it? Uh, the electronic meeting change. Uh, you just have to pay attention, unfortunately. I don't, uh, the, if, if you, um, uh, I don't know that there's like an email list, for example, you know, you can subscribe to certain law firms that practice in this area. Um, have newsletters where they update uh, nonprofits about regular changes. We have our newsletter, um, uh, but I don't know that there's a government website you can go to where it sort of, you know, would uh, announce um, all these new changes. Uh, thank you, Heather. Will Cleo announce it? Yes, Cleo will announce it. Yeah. Other questions about members' meetings? Okay, not seeing any. Um, moving on to governance structure. Do directors have to be members? So it's not that ONCA changes anything when it, when it comes to uh, directors and members, but if this is the first time you're looking at your governing documents in a while, um, and you've been using these terms interchangeably, or you've lost track of who the members are and so on, then this can be a great opportunity to relearn some of these terms. Um, uh, yes, I will address the, the, the difference in membership classes um, in a moment once I've explained who members are and who, who the directors are. So do directors need to be members? So the first thing to recognize um, is that uh, there are two separate uh, roles, not necessarily two different groups of people, but two separate roles. Members are, le uh, are to nonprofits like shareholders are to for-profits. Members are responsible for electing directors, removing directors. They're responsible for approving changes to bylaws. They're uh, approving the major sales of assets or mergers and acquisitions or changes to purposes. So they have this kind of oversight role. Directors are responsible for overseeing or executing the management of the nonprofit on the, on the more regular basis, right? So it's not just that members meetings, either uh, annually or whatever on ad hoc basis, directors on an ongoing basis are exercising oversight of the nonprofit's operations. Directors are not required to be members. However, if a nonprofit wants to require directors to be members, they can do so, but they have to explicitly say so in their bylaws that directors are required to be members. So I also get the question, do we have to have members? The answer is almost certainly yes. 
with the very rare exceptions of certain special act corporations, all nonprofits in Ontario uh, have members and are required to have members. Now, it's it's fairly common. I get this question a lot. I, you know, for nonprofits to have lost track of who their members are. So, what does a nonprofit do in a situation like that? Well, the first place to look to figure out who the members are is the governing documents, the bylaws, constitution, et cetera, um, for a definition of who qualifies as a member, and then figure out, well, who meets that qualification. If the current governing documents don't seem to include any definition or qualifications, then a nonprofit can go back through past versions or through minutes of past meetings to figure out, was there any previous definition or was anybody appointed as a member in a previous member uh, or board meeting? Um, if the nonprofit doesn't find anything anywhere, um, then by default under the ANCA, the, the members of a nonprofit are the founding directors, so those people listed in the letters patent, and anyone appointed as a member by the board. Uh, so figuring out those who those people are um, uh, can be important, you know, if they are uh, dead or otherwise unreachable, um, you know, then uh, perhaps uh, seeking legal advice uh, might be appropriate. Okay, so that's who the members are. So now we can approach um, tomorrow's question, which is what are the difference between uh, different member classes? So nonprofits can have more than one type of member. This is referred to as member classes. Um, the uh, the difference um, could be in how they qualify to be members. So you could have, for example, uh, youth membership and senior membership, for example. It could be in their voting rights. Uh, you could have voting members and non-voting members, um, or it could be in many other ways. Um, for example, there could be different rules for fees, different rules for who knows what, right? But it's possible to have um, uh, different um, classes of members. Our bylaws provide for both AGM and general members meetings uh, to approve uh, matters or of concern for the org. Will this continue to be allowed under ANCA? Yes, so members, uh, both uh, uh, an annual general meeting, which is required to ha uh, be had um, in the timeline I mentioned, um, can uh, have to happen. And then uh, the board uh, has the power to call a members meeting whenever. So that is certainly still allowed. In some cases, members can actually demand that a members meeting be called. If members who control 10% of the votes in the organization demand th that the board call a members meeting, under uh, uh, certain circumstances, the board has to call the members meeting. So not only is it still allowed, in some cases it's required. We have adult and junior members, but on uh, those over, but only those over 18 are allowed to vote at AGM slash members meetings or to serve as director. What does Anka say about this? Um, so again, with the caveat that I can't comment on your specific situation, um, what I can say uh, in general is that there is no age requirement for membership, uh, meaning uh, it's not necessarily the case that somebody has to be uh, 18 or older to be a member, and it's not necessarily the case that they need to be 18 or older to be able to vote. Now, you know, do you want five-year-olds to be able to approve major sales of assets? Maybe. If you're a very democratic daycare, for example, or maybe not. So that, that's something to keep in mind about what are the actual powers of members. Um, there are lots of ways to recognize that people are part of the community uh, besides just them being a corporate member. And in fact, they may not even realize uh, the powers of corporate governance they have as a result of being um, members. Uh, is it required to have a membership list? Yes, it is required to have a membership list, as we will talk about on the um, records. You know, I should put that slide first, because honestly, uh, it's probably the most uh, popular area of questions I get. Um, but so I'll cover it now. Uh, members list has to contain the following information. The names, the start date, the end date, because it includes former members as well, going back six years. Um, the physical address where the member agreed to receive documents from the nonprofit. It doesn't have to be their residence. It's an address for service, meaning an address where they received, uh, they agreed to receive official um, documents. Their email address, if they agree to receive documents electronically. And if you have multiple types of members, what type of member they were. So that uh, list has to be kept going back six years. 
And it's important to have the list because members have rights. I've already mentioned a few of them, like demanding members meetings, like voting at annual general meetings. Uh, so you need to know who has the power to exercise these rights. Does ONCA permit staff members to be voting members? Uh, yes, um, there's no restriction on who can be a member of a nonprofit. They don't have to be residents in Canada. They can be staff. They can be directors. They cannot be directors. A nonprofit can, uh, if it wants to ex exclude or disqualify anyone from being a member, um, has to explicitly say so in the governing documents. Um, yeah, so Christina points out, Anka does not police the member's demand for a general member's meeting. So that's true. As I mentioned, there are no Anka police. So if members demand it and the board doesn't deliver, what do those members do? Um, short of taking uh, the nonprofit to court, there isn't a, a mechanism for enforcement other than the members, um, you know, if the, if the board fails to call it within 21 days and they were legally required to call it, any member can then uh, call the members meeting themselves and they can hold it. Um, and then this is sort of where you get into governance disputes of, uh, you know, one faction claims we had a valid members meeting and we elected our board, your board is no longer legitimate, you know, and that's when you start ending up uh, in court. Um, did you say that AGMs must be held 15 months from previous AGM or six months from the end of fiscal year? If so, by default, wouldn't it always be within the six months of uh, fiscal year end? Um, so there are lots of uh, fun permutations about how you would end up with different timelines. I'm not going to get into them. Suffice it to say, there is a reason for why there are both these, these time restrictions, and it's whichever is the earliest of the two. There are situations, even rare ones, where one ends up earlier than the other, and, and both could be earlier than the other. We have it stipulated that our members are from previous fiscal year, so uh, they could potentially change each year. That's true. Uh, membership can change even on a daily basis, uh, and a nonprofit is required to keep a members list, um, you know, on an ongoing basis. Um, Sean asks, we're considering moving our end of fiscal year so that 16 months time constraint will have to be factored in uh, when we make the change. Okay, so that's, um, that's an, uh, an interesting uh, consideration. Um, and I believe there was another question. Can the members be the board of directors? Uh, so yes, uh, a nonprofit can have a, a membership structure wherein the only members are the board uh, and the, the board are the only members. This is called a self-perpetuating board structure. If you go uh, on our website um, under resources, uh, you'll see a, a page called membership structures and it goes through different types of structures that a, a nonprofit can have. Um, and the pros and cons. And, and this is one of the structures discussed. So it's okay under ANCA to have a fluid membership list that is kept for at least six months. So six years, but the, um, the, the, membership, uh, the membership list, I mean, because you're, you're, uh, the membership list includes current and former directors going back six years, it's fluid in the sense that you're always adding on to it, right? But you're not taking anyone off of it um, uh, in any period shorter than six years. Okay, uh, do we, um, are all members entitled to vote? So when we talked about membership classes, uh, we discussed uh, this question, the answer is no, you could have some members who are not entitled to vote. If you want members who are not entitled to vote, you have to explicitly say so. Previously, that could be said in the, in the bylaws. And if you said that in your bylaws, it continues to be valid until you wanna make changes to it. If you don't say it, now going, uh, since ANCA took effect on October 19th, 2021, it has to be specified in the articles if you wanna change people, uh, vote, members voting rights. Do we have to have a chair? Yes. Um, previously under Ontario Corporations Act, every nonprofit had to have a president or secretary. Now under ANCA, uh, every nonprofit has to have a chair. Um, the chair, uh, they, so it's no longer required to have a president or a secretary, but you're still welcome to do so if you want. The chair, uh, which is an officer position, has to be a member of the board. So they need to be both an officer and a director. Other officers do not need to be members of the board unless your governing documents explicitly say so. Does the board have the power to remove a director? No, they do not. The only people with the power to remove a director are the members. 
uh, by a simple majority vote at a members meeting or by a unanimous written resolution outside of a members meeting. There are some workarounds for this. Um, for example, uh, the board, if they're explicitly given this power in the governing documents, does have the ability to discipline or remove members. And it is possible, as we discussed, to, to make it a requirement for a director to be a member. So by removing them as a member, they cease to qualify as a director. So that can be an indirect way that a board exercises the power to remove a director. Um, another way that a director can be in, uh, indirectly removed without having a membership vote is through what's called a deemed resignation. Um, so it's common for many nonprofits, they have a provision that says, you know, if a director misses three meetings in a row without excuse, right, they automatically stop being a, a director. This is considered a deemed resignation. So a nonprofit can have in its bylaws situations that are considered deemed resignations, violations of the policies, violations of the bylaws, etc. cetera, um, in which case, who would determine if there's been a violation? Uh, well, the bylaws could specify that, but uh, generally speaking, uh, it would be the board. How long are directors allowed to serve? Previously, the maximum term limit was five years. The uh, directors could run for as many terms as they wanted, but there needed to be an election at least every five years. Now that's been reduced to four years under ANCA. So again, directors can run for as many terms as they want, um, unless the bylaws say otherwise. Um, but there needs to be uh, an election at least every four years. If the nonprofit's bylaws say nothing about the, the, the director's term, then by default, it's until the next AGM. Um, so that's if you say nothing. The, the bylaws can say two years, they can say three years, they can say something else up to four years. Are articles, bylaws, constitution, and policies the same? So we've uh, thankfully already addressed this question a few times. All right, so some questions. Um, is there wording templates for board of directors membership? So uh, it, there, on our um, website, um, there is a uh, sample bylaws with options. So you may be able to take some wording from that. You can also go to our bylaw builder and generate a set of bylaws, uh, which would also include wording uh, for the, the size of the board. Um, generally speaking, the size of the, the, the board uh, under ANCA needs to be put in the articles. So it's not something that would go uh, in the bylaws uh, going forward. Previously, it could be put in the bylaws and if that's where it is, that continues to be fine as long as the nonprofit doesn't make any changes to the size of the board, but going forward, it would need to be put in the articles. Just to clarify, in order to be a member with our organization, persons need to pay annually. Yet you are saying they are members for six years. Am I understanding that correctly or could you clarify? The list of current and former members needs to be kept for six years. So it doesn't mean that everyone who's on that list is a member for six years. What it means is that within the last six years, at some point they were a member. So that list of members includes the start date and also the end date of the members. So it includes former um, uh, uh, members. Uh, but this is, this is a good occasion to talk about membership terms. By default, membership just continues until the individual resigns, dies, uh, 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 or is um, removed uh, by the nonprofit if the nonprofit has rules around that. Um, there's no default term of one year. If a nonprofit wants the, the term of membership to be a year or to be, you know, uh, at the end of the payment period or whatever, they have to actively say so in the governing documents. So sorry, I missed the answer to this previous question. Did you say AGMs must be held 15 months from previous AGM or six months from fiscal year end? If so, by default, wouldn't it always be within six months of fiscal year end? So the, uh, the answer is you, you heard that right, it's those two limits. And there are situations in which um, either of those dates could be earlier than the other. That's why both of those, those rules are there. Okay, are there other questions about governance structure? Just to clarify, if articles, formerly letters patent, does not match current bylaws, then we have to amend the articles. So articles um, uh, trump bylaws. So any inconsistency between the two will be resolved in favor of the articles. Uh, so there's no requirement to change the articles because the bylaws say something. 
um, the, the, any part of the bylaws which, are, which contradict the articles uh, are simply legally ineffective. Um, if, uh, so about the term of directors, um, so again, if the articles say one thing about term of directors and the bylaws say another thing about terms of directors, the term of directors set out in the articles uh, will, will take precedence. Um, the, what, what I mentioned when I said the articles may need to change is the size of the board um, previously was very often specified in the bylaws. Um, under ONCA, um, the size of the board needs to be specified in the articles. However, ONCA has special transition rules that say, if you have the size of your board already in your bylaws, we're not going to consider it ineffective. It's going to continue to be valid. You don't have to move it over to the articles. However, if you ever want to make changes to the size of your board, you're going to have to make those changes in the articles because going forward, the size of the board needs to be in the articles. So that's what I was referring to uh, when I was talking about changes to the articles. Changing the size of the board in the bylaws as of October 19, 2021 is no longer effective. Um, is there any other area uh, uh, that like the number of board members that if you change your bylaws, you would need to put this in the articles? Yes, yeah, so the answer is there are four areas four main areas. Uh, number one, the size of your board. Number two, if you have multiple membership classes. If you have multiple membership classes, that needs to be specified uh, in the articles. However, if you have it specified in the bylaws, that's fine. But if you want to make any changes to membership classes, that needs to be specified. Those membership classes need to be set out in the articles. The voting rights of members. Um, by default under ONCA, uh, one member, one vote. If you have a different voting structure and that's specified in the bylaws, that's fine, but, but as of October 19th, 2021, that's expected to be put in the articles. So if you ever make changes to the voting uh, structure, that needs to be put in the articles. And then finally, number four, a dissolution clause. A dissolution clause is what happens to your property um, if, you're, if your nonprofit ever dissolves. That means it, it ceases to exist as a corporation. Um, after you pay off your creditors, if you still have property left, the question is who gets that property? A dissolution clause answers that question. Previously, dissolution clauses could be put into the bylaws. Um, and if you have them there, um, that's, that's fine. Um, however, uh, going forward, uh, a non ONCA uh, requires that dissolution clauses be put um, in the articles. Right, so if you ever make changes to your dissolution clause, that new dissolution clause needs to be put uh, in the articles. Um, and Maria asks, minutes have to be kept for board meetings. Do they also have to be kept for all committee meetings? The answer is yes. Uh, Anka says you need to keep four types of minutes, board meeting minutes, board committee meeting minutes, members meeting minutes, member committee meeting minutes. Um, if a member has not paid membership for three years and nor have they resigned, are they still a member if uh, delinquency of payment not mentioned in the bylaws? Um, it, it really depends uh, on the wording of the bylaws uh, and uh, how the fee is referred to. Um, failing to pay a fee in and of itself under ONCA doesn't cause a person um, to stop uh, being a member. Um, however, uh, depending on how the requirement to pay that fee is worded uh, in the governing documents, uh, you know, if there's a membership application form and what it says about the fee and so on, all of these factors can change uh, the effect of, of not paying. If a volunteer cannot be found to fill a board position, can someone fill two positions at once? Uh, so it's important to distinguish between directors and officers. So directors are just seats on the board. Um, the officers are specific positions such as president, secretary, treasurer, vice president, et cetera. The difference is board uh, positions are, the role of the board is exercised collectively through board resolution, so it's a collective power, whereas officers have specific jobs that they're asked to do, like the, the treasurer oversees the finances and so on, right? So an individual can hold more than one officer position. That's possible unless the governing documents say otherwise. However, an individual cannot occupy more than one board seat. 
They cannot exercise, you know, uh, two votes on the board, for example, on behalf of two seats, um, unless there is some kind of specific voting structure um, in the uh, the governing documents. Um, but uh, but a, an individual cannot occupy two board seats. We are having some volunteer fatigue and no one is stepping up to be an officer, e.g. president, vice president, secretary, but we have a treasurer and past president. The past president has been acting president. Are we in trouble? Um, so again, can't comment on your particular situation. The one thing I would note is that the only officer position ANCA requires a nonprofit to have is chair. No other position is required unless the governing documents say otherwise. So governing documents, you know, if they say the officer position absolutely has to be fulfilled, filled, then a nonprofit may be, you know, out of step with their own governing documents. But ANCA does not require a nonprofit to fill any position other than chair. Um, for organizations that have challenges recruiting board leadership. Okay, great. Um, can the chair slash president vote at the AGM board and or committee meetings? Um, so uh, it depends on who the chair is. So at a member's meeting, um, only uh, members can vote. The chair of a member's meeting doesn't have to be a member. You, you could have different rules about who the chair is. You may say the, the chair is not allowed to be a member. They have to be from outside in the community or whatever. In such a case, the chair is not allowed to vote. Um, if, the, if the chair is a member, they're allowed to vote like other members and nonprofits can have special voting procedures, for example, uh, reserving the chair's vote until after the vote to see if there's a tie so that they can break a tie. Um, those kinds of structures are possible. Similarly, only board members can vote at a board meeting. As I mentioned, the chair has to be a, uh, a, uh, a member of the board. Um, they, uh, um, if they're a member of the board, they can vote alongside other members. Um, if uh, a nonprofit has some kind of structure where they cast a second vote or a deciding vote or so on, that needs to be um, explicitly uh, set out in the um, governing documents. Oh, thank you. I, I did not cover Jim's uh, question. So thank you for uh, raising that again. When updating articles, do we have to keep the names of the original directors or do we keep them and update the list of new directors at the end of the articles? So the way articles get changed is not by creating a new set of articles. It's by filing what are called articles of amendment. And in the articles of amendment, uh, you're not revising the, what's in the, you know, in the original um, uh, list of directors. You, you are saying, you know, such and such provision is changed or such and such provision is added. So the articles of amendment get added to your records as a kind of addendum. So you have your original articles and you have your articles of amendment and you read them together. And that's how you know uh, what's in your um, articles. Any complications with a chairperson making motions if they are also a member of the board? So um, Anka uh, really doesn't go into detail about these kinds of governance or, or, or meeting procedural rules. Nonprofits have a lot of flexibility uh, when it comes to setting their uh, meeting procedures. Uh, could there be complications that arise? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are lots of things that can happen in terms of good governance, uh, but as far as legal requirements go, um, there's, there's no um, uh, specific rule uh, that this violates um, in the ANCA. Okay, just, just being mindful of time, I'm going to move on to uh, the next slide. Records and minutes, right? Everybody's favorite topic. Uh, so we've already talked about how many years minutes need to be kept for, and we already talked about what minutes need to be kept. So I'll just review. Board meetings, board committee meetings, members meetings, member committee meetings. All the years need to be kept. That's not realistic for lots of nonprofits, right? So here's where we remember, there are no ANCA police. Um, the, the, the years that matter most from a practical perspective are the previous seven years. Um, if, the Canada, if you're a charity and Canada Revenue Agency audits you, right? Lacking these records could affect your charitable status. Um, this is not new, this was true before ANCA. Um, the, uh, uh, the key thing uh, outside of that seven year period is it's a risk assessment. What do we need these records for? What might we wanna rely on them for? Um, 
what does Anka say about in-camera minutes? So the answer is Anka doesn't say anything directly about in-camera minutes, but this raises the question, who has access to board minutes? So um, to explain, what are in-camera minutes? In-camera minutes are when the board is dealing with some kind of uh, sensitive issue, so it, it doesn't want those that discussion to be public, so it goes into an in-camera session and those minutes are maybe kept separately or, or they're not distributed as widely. So according to Anka, the only people who have a right to access board minutes are the board, so board members, um, the auditor or financial reviewer, and court-appointed investigators or other government officials. Other people, including staff, including members, including members of the public, donors, etc., do not have the right to access board meeting minutes. Now, a nonprofit can, in its governing documents, say they do have the right. Right? They can make it more publicly accessible than Anka requires, but they don't have to. So in-camera minute, this might be enough for nonprofits that you know, uh, want to keep in-camera minutes, uh, where they might want to keep in-camera minutes in a separate folder and so on, in which case that's less an Anka question and more a practical IT question. When do we need to start keeping director consent forms? So uh, Anka requires that nonprofits get written consent from directors to act as directors. So when somebody gets elected as a director, that's not when they become a director. They become a director when they consent in writing to act as a director. It doesn't have to be a fancy form. It just needs to say, I so-and-so, as of such date, the start date of their term, agree to act as director of such and such organization. Here's my address, so you know who we're talking about. And here's my signature, right, to confirm that we consent. Minutes of the meeting where they were elected, unless they happen to contain all those elements, do not count as a consent because minutes don't tell you that individual consented. They tell you the members consented of that person acting as a director. Nomination forms could count. Confidentiality forms, code of conducts, et cetera, that you might get a director to sign. All of these could count, right? The question is, do they contain those essential elements? The government has said there will be a prescribed director consent form. It has not yet made that director consent form available. There is a form. So for those wondering, is there a template? There is a form for first directors of a nonprofit, um, which contains all these essential elements. The only thing that would need to be taken out is first, the word first, because they're not, um, they're not your first directors. Director consent forms need to be uh, kept under ONCA as of October 19th, 2021. Okay, so this, this is not something that kicks in at the end of the transition period. This is something that started in 2021. And so that also addresses what counts as a director consent form and what can we do if our members don't want their information shared with other members? Okay, so we talked about a members list. You need to keep a members list going back six years. What I didn't mention was that members have a right to access this list. They can request a copy from the nonprofit. The reason they have a right to access this list is because they have various rights to organize with other members. I mentioned members with who control 10% of the vote can demand a members meeting. Members who control 5% of the vote can nominate a director. So members have the right to uh, communicate with other members, and so they have a right to access this list. This raises all kinds of privacy concerns, which the government is well aware. We're well aware. We've kept this on the government's radar. Um, the, the, the key thing, um, is two things. Number one, the address of the member doesn't have to be their personal address. It's just the address for service. One workaround that some nonprofits use is to list the nonprofit's own address as the address for service, which basically just means the member agrees to receive official documents at the address of the nonprofit. That's one workaround. It might not be appropriate for everyone, but it could work for some. Um, another note is that if a nonprofit, if someone makes a request uh, to get the list of members. They have to sign a statutory declaration saying they will only use it for allowable purposes. If they use it for any not allowable purpose, meaning something not connected to the nonprofit, then they could uh, be taken to court by a member or by the nonprofit and face up to $5,000 in fines per misuse uh, and up to six months in jail. Not that there has been any jail time assigned, but it's in theory, it's possible. It's a penalty under the act. Now, you may say that's cold comfort, getting someone to sign a form like that. If a nonprofit just doesn't want to give the information, period, then they have the ability to go to the Superior Court of Ontario and explain 
to the Superior Court of Ontario why they shouldn't have to give the information. But the, uh, the onus is on the nonprofit to do that, not the member requesting the information. Now, I, I, know, I know the we're coming up on time. Um, so very quickly, I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, speak very briefly about these questions. I'll look in the chat and then I'll, I'll close by sharing a survey uh, with you and I'll share my email address. And hopefully we'll be done in one to two minutes. So number one, um, was an audit always required? ONCA does not require an audit for anyone who previously didn't already require an audit, okay? There's only more flexibility, not less. Audits previously were required in almost all cases, unless a nonprofit had annual revenue under 100,000. If you have not been getting an audit all this time, remember, no ONCA police. What could happen is a member uh, can go to court and demand that the court re require you to get uh, an audit. So that's the risk. Number two, does X agreement make us a public benefit corporation? So there's the status under ONCA called public benefit corporation. Charities are automatically public benefit corporations. Nonprofits that receive more than $10,000 in gifts or donations last year uh, from public sources um, become uh, uh, public benefit corporations. The sources could be sponsorship agreements, could be funding agreements, could be different types of agreements. Whether or not they count towards your public benefit corporation uh, depends on whether they are gifts, meaning you're getting the money not in exchange for anything, or they are in an exchange, meaning you're getting a sp they sponsor you and they're expecting and are legally entitled for recognition in exchange. That's the key question. Is there an exchange or is it a gift? Question number three, does ANCA affect who can be paid in the organization? Um, the answer is no. There are, are rules uh, around, uh, especially for charities, it's very, very rare that an employer or contractor can serve on the board uh, of a charity, and those who do have to follow the guide paying directors and connected persons. Um, but generally speaking, Wonka doesn't, doesn't change um, who can be paid. Uh, on, uh, on the board. For public benefit corporations, only up to one third of the board can be uh, employees. Can we put in our bylaws that we don't want an audit? No. Uh, if you don't want an audit, you have to waive the audit each and every year at the members meeting, and our website contains details on how to do that. Okay, so that brings us um, to the end. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to put my email up on the screen here, and uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, highlight, the, sorry, I'm going to highlight uh, the um, uh, um, survey, which I'll put in the chat, but I'm just going to check um, the questions. Do you have to file articles of amendment every time you change your directors? No, you file a notice of change, uh, which is a much simpler form uh, and does not cost uh, as much. Um, can you clarify directors consent forms were supposed to be collected since 2021? That's correct. We provide an online directory of current members. Does that comply uh, with ONCA? It depends if the directory uh, contains all the information uh, we mentioned. Um, Lisa asks, $10,000 or $100,000 to qualify as a public benefit corporation? The answer is $10,000. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, and the final tally is, uh, five, nine. Okay, well, we covered somewhere between 60 and 70 questions. So not bad. Um, and I would just, and my question for you at the end of today uh, is, could you please fill out the following survey? I'm sure uh, being involved in nonprofits, everyone appreciates here. Uh, that funders, and incidentally, all this is funded by the Law Foundation of Ontario, uh, funders uh, love survey results. Um, so please do fill out this survey. And it also helps make this uh, uh, session that much better. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for this great, great session. Thank you to everyone for your questions. I know we didn't get to exactly every question that was in the chat, so I will go through that and forward any ones that we missed or didn't get to just due to time. Uh, and hopefully Benjamin will be able to answer those and I can send that out. His email will be is, is in the slide deck that you should have received before this presentation started. So again, check your spam or your junk folders. And I will also send out the survey link um, because yes, your feedback is really important um, as we go through this, this process. Want to let you know about a few other um, sessions that are coming up. 
Volunteer Holton is hosting two sessions on board governance and on holding productive and compliant meetings, uh, February 7th, February 21st. I'll include the information for those. So for those that are you know, concerned about how does this all work, um, I do reference back into ANCA around that. Uh, and then we're also going to be hosting a bylaws, bring your own bylaws workshop in March. That information is coming out soon, but again, that will be a great uh, tool for, for those that want to participate as you go through the process of looking at your bylaws and getting them updated. So again, thank you so much for being here today. You will get the recording. Um, as soon as I can get the uh, cloud system to download it, <laughs> that will be coming out. So, and you're welcome to share that recording with other members of your board. So thank you everyone for being here. Benjamin, thank you so much for a great session today. Really appreciate it. And uh, have a great rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thank you.